we did unpack a little bit, and as you know, looking forward is always more difficult than looking behind. As they say, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> but we uh, we did unpack, you know, that the last age, uh, if we could say, I think we all, or let's just say the way I see it, an age is about 2,000 years. But at the same time, there are days. Second Peter says that, uh, do not forget this one thing that is a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. So the last two days were day five and six. Day five was Jesus introduced the grace covenant, the covenant of grace. And so five being symbolic of grace. And what is six symbolic of? Man. And of course, the ultimate man in the carnal sense is 666 is where we get Antichrist. But anyway, what happened in the day six? Well, we had, uh, especially in the last uh, 100, 200 years, we had the Industrial Revolution. The expression, probably one of the height, heights of mankind's cunning and intelligence is we created the Industrial Revolution. So the earth filled with factories and machines and smoke and, you know, just all the stuff that is evidence of mankind. We also had uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first and second great awakening, and some believe that we're either now or about to move into what they call the third wave. I don't have a lot of thoughts about that. But uh, so if day six was indicative of man, what is day seven symbolic of? Perfection, rest, heaven. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, Let's talk about the age. Remember, ages are 2,000 years. So we're we're moving into this next age. And what is the symbol, the constellation, or the Maseroth that Job speaks of over this age? The heavenly man, or Aquarius, as you mentioned, Donna. And what is the symbol of the heavenly man? Our of Aquarius. It's the heavenly man pouring out water from a pitcher from heaven over the earth. I think for all my heart, in fact, this is what really one of the most central things that inspire me in our specific journey of ascended life. This is one of the things that inspires me almost more than anything else. If we can take anything from the past, if we can learn anything from the past, and the symbolisms of the ages and the days and extrapolate what we learn from the past onto our future. Our future seems to indicate heaven, perfection, and rest and heavenly man pouring out water over the earth. I believe, in answer to your question, Mike, I believe with all my heart that the main thing is going to be the sons and daughters of God learning to live in heaven at least as well if not better than we've ever lived on earth learning or coming into our heavenly identity and coming into the realities of the heavenlies and I believe that's where Isaiah 60 begins to manifest in our lives arise shine for your light has now come and the glory of the Lord's risen upon you and then that's where the nations come running to your brightness Now, that's a little redundant, but in answer to your question, that's kind of the core of what really keeps me in the saddle. I do not want to be, and I just told the group last night, I do not want to be an average Christian that just kind of bumbles my way through life hoping to go to heaven. That's not good for me. That's not good enough. It, It actually hurts my heart to think that way. And so... I want to walk in what I do believe the Lord is giving us, and that is a revelation of what's available. I like thinking about Peter, James, and John, just uh, gnarly old country guys, fishermen, you know, smelly. They probably laid down in bed and they reeked of fish, you know, at night, and it's just like, you know, just un unrefined. 
and uh, just bumble around. They probably were ruffians, and of course, James and John were known as sons of thunder. You know, they didn't get that for no reason. <laughs> and Jesus says, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Now, I think of, he selected us kind of in the same way. We had no idea. Back when you and I first, I'll just say for myself, when I first got saved, I had no idea we were on the cusp of an age change. Who knew? Nobody knew that. And yet, Jesus said, you come follow me and I'll transform you. You'll become fishers of men. Oh, here they are. They are arguing among themselves and they get their moms in the arguments and, you know, back and forth. And it's like, who's going to be the greatest? And, and they don't know sick them. <laughs> and then their hero dies. Oh, my gosh, their hero dies. The one who is going to be the the core, the catalyst, the, the whole reason that this thing is going to take place. And then he dies. Like, what in the world, Jesus? You kept saying stuff, and we had no clue, and we still don't know. What, were, what was their safety? I was just thinking about it. What was their safety? What guaranteed or best assured their safe passage from being bumbling ruffians to becoming the apostles who established the church? the early church what was that I think it's you know both God and man Jesus wouldn't let him leave and when he knew they were all going to leave he prayed for him told Peter I have prayed for you and when Satan has sifted you like wheat and when you return you know so Jesus was proactive but the other thing was too they knew that there was no place else that had the words of eternal life and that touches me because you and I, we're old enough in the Lord, there ain't no place in religion that's holding a candle to this tender place of intimacy with Jesus. That's the only place, not only are we going to have safe passage, but it's the only place to get fresh and new rhema. And so, like Peter, you know, to whom else can we turn? Only you, Jesus, hold the words of eternal life. So we're on that threshold, just like Peter, James, and John, who were Jesus' peers at the time, probably born almost the same time, maybe slightly younger, but they were born in B.C., and they become the heralders and architects of A.D. Just amazing. And I think without any stretch, my belief system is that we are exactly in the same shoes as Peter, James, and John. Let's go back and pick up a point, Mike. Uh, you were talking about uh, the last 40 years in the prayer movement. Let's go now tie that into Simeon. And of course, he served in the temple, and he was a very committed and diligent prayer. And he had read the Messianic prophecies of the Torah and uh, various other prophecies. And he believed them, and he began praying into them. It was a big, big deal to him. And one day, God says, I promise you, Simeon, that you'll get to see this Messiah with your own eyes. Now, that was a really good day. That was a great day. You get a promise, a rhema from the Lord, that you get to see the answers to your prayers. That's a really good day. It's not as good as the day, of seeing him but it is a good day when you get a promise a rhema well then along comes the day when this young couple comes in with this little eight day old boy and uh, let me pull in this thought Simeon was an old gentleman as far as we know and uh, he could have become stodgy he could have become very patronizing and loyal to the system he could have had his own thoughts that uh, interpreted those messianic prophecies and he said, well, if it don't come like this, I ain't going to embrace nothing, you know. So he could have been that way. That's the way a lot of age does sometimes. And But no, here came this 
young couple and too young to have a baby I mean what in the world coming in with a baby here and instantly I think like in Elizabeth it says and John leaped in her womb I think Simeon's spirit leaped there was a quickening witness that said this is that which you prayed about for all these years I think his prayers sincere and not not religious not rhetorical not rhetoric prayers they weren't dutiful prayers they were prayers that from out of the sincere longing of his heart <laughs> and in so doing his heart stayed tender the whole time and it was tender enough that when this little baby came into his view his spirit man was easily moved he said now mine eyes have beheld the consolation of Israel or in other words the object of all of my passions prayers and longings are now in front of me and so uh, it was that moment that probably his greatest moment now take that over to Peter James and John now there was just one man in the temple with Simeon but with within a few years we have a few more people rallying along and Peter, James, and John, they didn't know much either. But here they were, unlikely specimens, <laughs> to be the builders, the architects of the early church. And somehow they were drafted, and somehow they yielded, and somehow they learned. And here they are, now being the heralders. There were just a few, yes. But, but a few that embraced it, and when they embraced it, uh, they became the ones who actually established it in the earth. I don't know, just uh, thinking again of the relevance of us in our day as it relates to that scenario. Prayer movement prayed diligently and still is, rightfully so. No apologies, no shame. This is a wonderful thing, prayer movement but it's bringing forth something we probably didn't imagine. Uh, let's just speak about Daniel. Daniel, uh, the Bible says he was reading the books of the prophecies. In other words, the prophecies of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said you'll be taken in to captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel was reading these just like remember a while ago, let's see if we can derive some understanding from the past to extrapolate that into the future okay so Daniel's reading the book of the prophecy and he says whoa the years of Jeremiah's prophecies are accomplished and so what did he do he set himself to prayer and fasting including identificational repentance and he began to set the stage create the foundation upon which God could begin to move and bring forth a new movement and in kind of another way I believe that's what prayer movement has done in the last 40 years is setting a, a stage or a foundation for what God's wanting to bring forth I'm sorry one more thought and just like in Daniel's day Gabriel said I was set in motion from the day one from the day one I think 40 years ago prayer movement and of course then it started around the year 2000 with kind of proliferating around the world I think God says I saw you guys on day one I began turning the wheels till the gears could come together see they were all out here doing their thing and I had to bring the gears together and I begin maneuvering those gears back on day one don't get weary in well doing I think we are most blessed most blessed I really do uh, I am confident there are other groups and other movements around the earth that are pondering these thoughts but in comparison we are a small minority compared to the larger body of Christ and I think we're just like Peter James and John the 12 
you know, that are being um, programmed in a good sense. We're being drafted, we're being tooled, we're being equipped, we're being emboldened to not only own it ourselves, but now to be the proliferators.